Hello, I'm Daniel. Today we are going to talk about what is called preliminaries. Preliminaries. And it is essentially what we're talking about is what are the reasons we are entering a spiritual practice? Why are we doing it? What is motivating and inspiring us? That's essentially to make sure that this is all centered in the right attitude to get us going and keep us going. So there are several different ways we can think about it. And one way we can think about preliminaries is this. It's just that preliminaries include everything in your life that has happened before now that has brought you to these practices, that has brought you to meditation practice, that has brought you to want to live in a more awakened way. Everything that has brought you to that is a part of your preliminaries. So it's sort of about recognizing where we are and figuring out how to move forward. Reflecting on where you've been and where you're going to find your motivation. So like in my case, um, well, I lost uh, both of my parents when I was a teenager. And that was a real turning point in my life, obviously. And it sort of made me ask big questions about life and death in a way that maybe a lot of people when they're teenagers don't reflect on these. So that's sort of a huge part of preliminaries for me. I, Like many people, I felt like I never fit in anywhere in life. And that was a part of preliminaries for me too. But most of all, I had some real anxiety problems and I really had a lot of trouble getting through um, ordinary life, really, the basics of day-to-day -day life. And especially I had a real struggle in college and that's where I found Buddhism. That's when I started my meditation practice and I've sort of come and gone at it a few times. I've had periods where I'm really engaged and periods where I'm not so engaged and so that's what I wanted to talk about. That is really the preliminary for me. And you may have had really horrifying things that have happened to lead you, lead you to speak, seek a spiritual journey, and maybe not. But that's a thing to reflect on. We're trying to re reflect on it and find inspiration. What we're not trying to do is see the hardships in our history and in our present and look around to blame people. That's not what we're doing right now. That's, um, that's not to say your problems are your fault or you shouldn't worry about people who have victimized you, but it is to say that that's not what we're thinking about right now. We're thinking about what inspires and motivates us, including things that really are what we would call negative experiences, right? So we're thinking about all of that. Preliminaries. I... To also talk about pre preliminaries, um, I read about meditation practice and I studied it for a long time before I tried it. And I think a whole lot of people do that. And that's not good or bad. And then I was a practicing Buddhist for years before I went to a Buddhist temple and met other Buddhists. And that's because beginning is hard. Beginning anything is hard. Beginning spiritual practice is hard, beginning a workout routine is hard, beginning uh, better eating habits, that's hard, right? All these things are hard because beginnings are hard. Beginning all sorts of things is intimidating. I know all sorts of uh, Buddhist temples and meditation centers that are trying to figure out ways to be more welcoming to people and they don't, they don't know how. The first few times I met other Buddhists, other meditators, were actually very hard. Small talk is not a thing for me that I do very well. So making new friends or getting through getting to know you type stuff is really challenging for me, as I think it is for a lot of people. And that's sort of something I think about with preliminaries, too. This is not all intended to be things we do all on our own. So, engaging with others is part of our 
could be can be part of our preliminaries because it is so challenging for many of us. Beginnings are challenging for me. Um, and I think about that because a Buddhist teacher named Michael Stone, who passed away a few years ago, but he said on his, I was listening to his podcast and he said, we teach best what we need to learn. And we teach best what we, we need to learn. And that was incredibly moving to me. It was incredibly moving to me. And uh, the truth is, maybe I can say a thing or two about beginnings because we teach best what we need to learn, right? So beginnings are really challenging for me and they're really challenging for many people. So that's why we have to talk about, it may seem sort of weird that we spend time talking about beginning the practice, but we have to talk about it because because it is challenging. Because it is challenging. And it's challenging. Another way to think about this is oh, our meditation practice. I want to encourage you to start, if you haven't, to recommit, if you have, a meditation practice. Daily. Daily, if you can. Daily, if your life makes that possible and for almost everyone it does so i'll tell you what i do is and i haven't again i have had periods where i did a lot of meditation and other periods where i didn't do a lot so i certainly don't judge people for struggling to do it the truth is we find reasons not to do it i could sit and meditate today or i could watch netflix right that is a constant battle for me as it is for Many people, I'm sure, maybe people don't like to admit that, but I'll tell you what I do is I get up in the morning early before my workday started starts and I go to my, I have a, a spot where I sit, a corner of my living room where there's a pretty white Buddhist statue, Buddha statue, He's, it's the size, life size. And I light a stick of incense and I pull out my cushion, which I have a meditation cushion and I sit on it and I set a timer and I meditate for 15 minutes. And I do this every day when I get up. It's the basically the first thing I do and putting it as part of my routine is what makes it possible for me. If I just, when I first started meditating many years ago, I would just meditate like when I felt like it and that meant what did it mean? It meant I didn't meditate. So a routine is really powerful here. And so I just do that every day. And sometimes I'll end that with some chanting. Often, often at the, after the 15 minutes, I will do some chanting. I will take my, my beads here, 108 beads, and I will chant something 108 times. And it really is, these practices really mean a lot to me. I'm not gonna tell you to chant. But I am going to tell you to have a sitting practice and to sit and meditate every day, 15 minutes or longer. I'm probably going to expand it to longer soon. I feel really good about my, um, my consistency right now. So I'm a little bit nervous about expanding it, but I, I would like to, I think it'd be good to do it longer than 15 minutes. So with that being said, um, we're going to do a super short one minute meditation here. And then I will talk about the traditional way we talk about preliminaries, the traditional way. Because I've talked about my, sort of more my version. And in, after we meditate for one minute, I'm going to talk about the traditional version, okay? So I'm going to ring. I've got my little bell here. I have this singing, singing bowl. Some people call it a bell. Some people call it a bowl. It's a singing bowl. Came with a stick. And I'm going to ring this. And then I'm going to watch the time. And I want you... All you're going to do is sit, be present, notice what comes up in your mind. That's it. That's it. This is the method of no method. We're just going to sit, be present, notice what comes up in our minds, and that's it for one minute. Okay? And then at the end of the one minute, I will ring the bell again.
So that was just a very brief formless meditation. And you saw um, my version of instruction there was bare bones, almost none, right? I didn't tell you how to sit. I didn't tell you what to do with your hands. I didn't tell you anything. And uh, maybe later on, I'll, I'll go over that sort of thing. But I wanted to just, just give space for no method, okay? So now I'm going to talk about the tr traditional way of reflecting on the preliminaries, okay? The traditional way. And that is constituted by four things, four things of, four ways of thinking about this world we found ourselves in. Four ways of thinking about human life. And when we reflect on these four ways, the hope is it motivates and inspires us to be diligent, to take these practices very seriously, and to really try, really try hard, and not be wishy-washy, and not just walk away and decide we don't care. These are the four things that really inspire us in this spiritual journey. And so the first one is called precious human life. Precious human life. And usually that means we're lucky. That is, no matter who you are, no matter your circumstances, you are lucky to be in the position right now to be in a time and place where you can receive teachings like these and to where you're reasonably comfortable. And some of you listening to me right now may not feel like your life is reasonably comfortable, and I'm sympathetic to that, and I understand that. But one thing you can reflect on is, one, out of human beings, a vast majority of them are less comfortable than you. A vast majority of human beings on this planet are less comfortable than you. And if we take it a step further and look in the past, throughout human history, an overwhelming vast majority of human beings are less comfortable than you. Overwhelming vast majority. We are so lucky to have running water to have air conditioning, to have indoor plumbing, to have clean food, to have soap. We are so fortunate in so many ways. And it's we don't really think about that much. We don't think about like, like what would have happened to me a thousand years ago. But life would not have been pleasant for almost everyone. For almost everyone, life would not, would not have been pleasant. So you, I'm, you can see I wear glasses, for example. If I lived a thousand years ago, I'd just be out of luck, not able to see very well, right? Notwithstanding other medical issues. We all have all sorts of things that make it so we're lucky to be here now. And now, in another way to think about that is, we are lucky to have this opportunity to communicate over the internet. So you're able to hear about this that just 20 years ago, man, 25 years ago, it would have been almost impossible, right? And that's another thing to reflect on. These teachings that are um, a few, few hundred years ago, people would travel hundreds of miles to get these teachings because they were just hard to find, hard to get, hard to receive. Hard to get and hard to receive. Way to go. So... Now we have the good fortune to have access to all of human knowledge, really. Not just spiritual teachings, but all of human knowledge. And maybe there are still some spiritual teachings that are hard, hard to get access to, but not like there used to be. Not like there used to be, right? And so that's an interesting thing to reflect on, right? It's available. It's... In much of the world, you can practice whatever spiritual spiritual practice you want without being afraid of being killed, right? And that wasn't true in all of human history, although in some of the world it's still not true. But um, 
If you're here with me now, you probably live in a place where it's safe to hear these teachings and safe to practice these practices, right? And that's something to reflect on. We are lucky. So why would we waste our lives? We are lucky, so we shouldn't squander this opportunity, but rather we should seize it. We can live in a more awakened way. We have this wonderful opportunity to be able to try to live in a more awakened way, and we should seize that instead of just letting that slip through our fingers. We should seize that. We have the precious human life, and we should use that to try to help ourselves and others and to live in a more positive, life-affirming, awakened way. So that's the first one. The second one is the reality of death. The reality of death. <clears throat> so that is not only, and I, I didn't even talk about animals, right? But lots of animals suffer more than human beings do. And I think that is well known. And I'm sorry for glossing over that, but also precious human life Lots of animals have short lives that are full of nothing but suffering. So that's another area where, where we're lucky. Um, and I might think like, well, I mean, my cats lay around all day. They seem pretty happy. Well, their lives are shorter than mine. And also, like, I don't know that they seem happy because sometimes it seems like they're really afraid I'm not going to feed them. It seems like they're really afraid I'm not going to feed them. So I don't know that they're happier than me. But anyway... Moving on, reality of death, right? Not only do we reflect on the fact that we are going to die, but also that applies to literally everything in the universe. Literally everything gro slowly grows old and dies, or quickly grows old and dies, right? Everything. We lose everything, everything breaks down, everything dies. So oh, that's depressing. And the other thing is, you don't really know. We don't really know how and when we'll die. Um, my parents didn't know they were going to get sick in their 50s, right? Uh, I think, and when I was little, uh, when I was a teenager, I didn't realize how young, how young it is to pass in your 50s, but now I'm... As I'm in my 40s, I think, oh, oh, that's not far away, right? People get sudden mysterious illnesses and die. People get hit by cars or in car accidents and die. People fall down the stairs and die. It can literally happen to anyone at any time. That's scary to think about. But I think of that song... live like you were dying. I'm not that familiar with it, but um, it is, you know, what would you do if you know you're going to die soon? What would you do differently? Would you be nicer to people, right? Would you pay closer attention to the things that are happening around you? Would you be more loving, more kind, more forgiving? The thought behind this is that you would, that you would bring more virtue to your life, more kindness to your life, because you know it ends. And you know that collecting things is fleeting. Sense pleasures are fleeting. If we learn how to be more present in our lives, to, med to practice meditation, to learn mindfulness, and to practice kindness, compassion toward others, we may not add more years to our life, but we can add more life to our years. That's some sort of quote by somebody, and I'm sure I butchered it. But the point is, we can live more fully right now by learning to make, pay attention, by having harmony with the world around us, and by cultivating wisdom and patience and equanimity. We can have a more full life, and we can... Appreciate the good things instead of getting carried away by the bad things all the time. We can appreciate the good things and have more fullness in our years so that we are 
we can be sure we're not wasting our lives languishing in worrying about how things could have been different or how we wish things were different because things are the way they are, right? And we can be here and figure out how to do the best with what we have, or we can just sort of be like, oh, well, you know, it's sad, this blah, blah, blah didn't happen for me, Mer, right? That's the thing. We can be fully present and tuned into this moment, and then we're going to have a more full, more pleasant, happier life. Excuse me. And the third one of these is, we call it karma. And I don't want you to get hung up on that word when I'm not talking about like magical spirit energies or anything. I'm just talking about, and I was hesitant to even use the word at all, but I'm just talking about how actions lead to results. Okay, well, duh, right? We have immense consequences of all of our actions, good and bad. Giant amounts of things happen based on what we do. Sometimes we think we don't matter and we are wrong. Every single thing you do has lots of effects. Lots of effects. So, if you just give someone a kind word, they could be in a slightly better mood the whole day and it, they could impact all sorts of people. You don't, we don't even know. Countless positive results or negative results can come from our actions and sometimes we don't even know, right? Or if you let somebody in front of you in traffic, that's a good one, right? Uh, they could be in a really good mood. If you cut them off, they could be in a really bad mood. They might even get in an accident later because they're in such a bad mood. We just, we, and we don't know, and we don't get to see the outcomes of all our actions. But what I want you to come away from this realizing is we have a huge impact on the world around us and on the people around us. We can touch lives and change them for the better. We can. Don't let anyone especially yourself, make you think you can't make a difference for the people around you because you can. A huge difference, okay? One time, uh, this friend of mine, he works in, he works in IT for big companies. And one time he came to me and he said, I don't feel like I'm doing good for the world in my job. What should I do? And he was not really, was not really in a position to just quit his job, right? And he's just working for this company that's just out to make money. Um, and maybe not always good to people, this company that he works for. But I told him what he can do is go into work every day and be pleasant to talk to and positive and just try to have a good impact on the people around you. And that is doing good. That is doing good in your career. And a lot of us feel like we can't do, it, do any good in our jobs. But you can just by being the nice person in the office. That is something. That is meaningful. We don't think that way, though. We don't think that way. So, that was the third one. And the last one is suffering. Suffering is a fact of life. Everything that's alive suffers. Everything that's alive has struggles, has worries has pain and some of that is because of course life's impermanent and death is coming but why do we need to remember this we need to remember this because if we remember that all the people around us are suffering have problems like we do even the people that seem like they've got it all together they're suffering they have problems they are getting sick. They are seeing people they care about get hurt. They are getting hurt. They are seeing people they care about get old and die. They are getting old, right? That is happening to every human being. And we're talking about that just to, as a reminder that a life focused on compassion is the only thing that makes sense. The only thing that makes sense. I like to say that it's like we're... We are trapped in a burning building together and we're just having little arguments instead of getting out. We're just having little arguments in there about what the furniture looks like and the building's on fire. 
that is that is life. Life is like a building on fire. And what do I mean by the getting out? That is practicing mindfulness and awareness and compassion. These are the things that help us reduce our suffering and the suffering of the people around us. So we bring harmony to ourselves and to our relationships and we make the world a better place for us and for everyone. For us and for everyone. And we can do that by learning how to be more present, by learning how to see things clearly, by learning how to just be nice to the people around us. And that seems, maybe that seems kind of naive or silly and it's, it's, it's not. It's not. It actually takes... Living with an open heart takes courage, and that's what we're talking about here. That's why some people say that that's why the term spiritual warrior exists. It's to remind us that it's brave to live with an open heart, because the truth is we've all been kicked in the heart a bunch of times. We've all been kicked in the heart, and we could close our hearts very easily and just try to be like machines and try to not have feelings. Um, and the truth is though, it's not a fight we'll win. Trying not to have feelings is not a fight we'll win. And that's number one. And number two is an open heart will make you happier. An open heart will make you happier in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that we'll get kicked in the heart again. An open heart will still make you happier. It is the way for us to live. The way, way for us to live. Don't let anyone bring you so low as to make you hate them, as to shut them out of your heart. We want to have open hearts because that's a reflection on us. That's a reflection on us rather than on whoever is doing a mean thing to us or whatever, right? So we want to have open hearts. And that's the way out of suffering. It's an open heart. It is insight. It is awareness. It is an open heart. When we learn how to be more aware of the world around us and to see things clearly, we don't suffer so much. And when we have open hearts also, we don't suffer so much. That might seem counterintuitive, but one thing we're going to learn how to do on this journey, two things. One is equanimity and that is just not falling apart when things go bad but having an even mind when things get really bad because they will and then the second one is sympathetic joy and that is being happy truly happy when other people succeed true happiness when other people succeed because you know what if you can be happy when other people succeed you can be happy all the time there is unlimited joy there if you can take joy in someone else's success. Real joy, not, not, oh, I'm happy for you, but real joyful feelings. You can get there. That is a thing we can learn to cultivate. It just all starts with having an open heart. It does. So that, those are the four things that are called the preliminaries are reflecting on these four things. Precious human life or I call it, don't waste your life. The reality of death, or we could call that impermanence. Karma, and that is just our actions have many, many consequences, good and bad. And the reality of suffering. Those are the four. I have seen someone say, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And I think about that a little bit. Um, there's a teaching called the second arrow, and I'll speak on that just for a minute. And that is um, a metaphor. The first arrow is when a bad thing happens to you. The second arrow is when you obsess about that bad thing and make it worse. When you obsess about that bad thing and make it worse. If, I, if my kids leave a toy on the floor and I'm walking barefoot and I kick it and I hurt my toe, right? The first arrow is my toe hurts. The second arrow is me getting mad, trying to place blame, trying to figure out whose fault that is, and going after them with anger. That's the second arrow. That doesn't serve me or them. So that's the story of the second arrow. That's it. That's simple and easy, right? So 
I want you to think about these preliminaries, precious human life, reality of death, karma, and suffering. I want you to do that, and I want you to see if you can find a good, quiet spot in your home and sit still for 15 minutes tomorrow. See if you can do that. Uh, what works for me is doing it in the same time and place every single day. I think that would work for you too. It's highly recommended. Consistency helps. Um, so that's it. That's how we begin. We reflect on those four things and we start having a daily meditation practice. And that is it for today. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Have a good day.